the GA Museum Remembers Bloody Sunday. Welcome to the fifth in our series of Mondays at the Museum Playbacks. This recording is of Michael Foley's lecture titled Remembering the Forgotten, which was recorded live on Microsoft Teams. Enjoy this brilliant lecture. Thanks for everybody. Uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in this evening. I know it's sort of a, it's a different sort of experience um, giving, a, giving a talk into a laptop, and I'm sure it's a different experience for everybody else looking in, uh, list, listening on, but um, I really do appreciate it. And I, it's, it's a real, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a humbling honor to be asked um, to speak on this topic on this month, in this year, um, the centenary of Bloody Sunday. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just a huge privilege to be able to talk about it with you tonight. And before I start, I'd just like to say thanks, first of all, to Gary and to Julianne as well, and Joanne Clark and Neve McCoy in the museum um, for organising tonight, for facilitating tonight, and also just for the support over the last bunch of years. You know, um, it's been a lot of hard work for everybody um, bringing the story of, of the Bloody Sunday Dead to a wider audience, trying to curate and put together this story again so that we can leave it in a better place um, in future. Um, but it's it's been a special time too, bringing these stories to life. And um, it's certainly something I won't forget down the years. And I, I, as I said, I'd just like to, when I get this opportunity, just to thank the people in the museum for all, for all their support down the years and that. And really, I suppose it's that, it's that sense of the forgotten that drew me into this story in the first place. The first time I ever came across Bloody Sunday really was in 2007 when Ireland and England uh, were playing in Crow Park in that famous Six Nations rugby game. I was working for the Sunday Times at the game. And obviously around the time there was a lot of discussion and debate about the idea of England playing in Crow Park, this place where Michael Hogan had been killed. The idea of the English flag flying over Crow Park, God save the Queen and all the, all the different paraphernalia that comes with a, with a rugby international and what it meant and what it meant having that game in Crow Park and, and, and what it meant to the GA to, to host it. But what I noticed about the coverage that time was that there was a lot of gaps in the stories or there was conflicting accounts or even small things like the names of people were slightly different. So you might find a Michael Feary in one place and a Michael Feeney somewhere else, uh, Michael Hogan. The Tipperary player who was killed on the day in Bloody Sunday was alter alternately kind of described as just a player or he was the captain. The game itself was described as an All-Ireland final. Sometimes it was a challenge game. Um, and it was it just it just struck me that for something that we we all have grown up with an idea of Bloody Sunday, whether it's through the Mighty Collins film or whether it's through our history books or whether it's through our secondary school teachings in, in history class. We all feel we know Bloody Sunday. Well, at least I certainly thought I did. I, I thought, of, you know, people killed in Croke Park, but even down to the numbers of people who were killed, if, depending on where you looked, it was anything from 12 to 16. So that even that very basic, simple number, <coughs> excuse me, how many people were killed? We didn't even really know that. And that's where it started for me. When I started into the research in 2011, it was just to try and fill those gaps as best I could. Strands together and, and pull that story together. but. Very quickly, as I went into the process, I realized that the real, that yes, that was a job of work that had to be done, and hopefully we could do that. But on top of that, the real power behind the story of Bloody Sunday is the people themselves. And the fact that their names and their faces and their stories have been lost down the years, really for the last, for the guts of the last hundred years, the only image that we have of Bloody Sunday in Crow Park is Michael Hogan. Like the whole story was distilled down to him, the Tipperary footballer, the martyr hero, the player who went out on the field and never came off the field again. And it's through no fault to Michael Hogan's and it's through no fault to the Hogan family that that's how it transpired. It was part of how the story was framed for an audience at that stage. So obviously the Hogan stand was named after Michael Hogan in 1926. And that became, of course, you know, one of the most famous pieces of architecture in Irish sport. Uh, Michael Hogan himself became Ireland's most famous sporting martyr and the GA itself became so inextricably linked to Croke Park and to Bloody Sunday and everything that that came with it that it changed the complexion of the GA, it changed how their story was told uh, forever. But the thing that struck me was when you distill a story down to one person and you tell it all through this one prism, you're removing 13 other people and you're removing you're removing nuance and you're removing those gray areas. It, those, those things that complicate a story. And I very much found is that the more I went into those people, I very much found that their stories, 
their lives, how they died, the circumstances of their death and what happened to their, their families afterwards and the legacy of Bloody Sunday going forward told us so much about why Bloody Sunday happened in the first place, what brought them all there and also kind of give me a sense of why it's important now, why, why are we even talking about this now 100 years later? I think it's the, the victim stories tell us why and it's something that we that we'll get into as 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 the as the talk goes along. What I'm going to do is I'm basically just going to go through it in terms of what happened in the, a little bit of the background, what happened in the morning of Bloody Sunday, how that linked to the afternoon. Uh, we can move forward then uh, once we, we we'll talk about what actually exactly happened in Crow Park and the people who died, then to their funerals, to how both sides try to try to control the story, the Bloody Sunday inquiries that occurred afterwards, and then the aftermath, as I say, the impact on families, uh, the impact on people, because that really to me is, is the greatest single impact of Bloody Sunday, is the impact on the families themselves um, and on the people affected. And it's not just the dead, it was anybody who was in that ground, anybody who experienced that day, I think they, they took away something from it that shaped them in some way for the rest of their lives. So just to start, I suppose, just to give a very quick background in terms of where the War of Independence was at in November 1920. It had been on nearly two years at that stage, having started really, I suppose, in January 1919 with the uh, with the with the ambush in Salahed Beg and the killing of a couple of RIC officers in Tipperary um, that really kick started the War of Independence in earnest. Um, it was a brutal war. Um, it was a guerrilla war. It was a war fought by the IRA on terms that the British authorities really weren't prepared for. Um, the British Army in Ireland at that stage numbered roughly 20,000, but it was very much depleted by World War I. It was young, it was inexperienced. Um, it wasn't the force that would have been there pre-1914 uh, in terms of authority and expertise, if you like, and, ex and, 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 and experience, as I say. Um, what also made the conflict difficult was the British refusal to treat it as a, a military war, if you like. They treated it as a police war. They treated it as criminality that was going on from the, from the IRA side. They didn't, they didn't send the military really into battle. It was as much as they could a police war, which had, a, which, which had an effect that impacted on, on Bloody Sunday itself. By July 1920, um, the Black and Tans were in place as a support group to the dwindling RIC, who in 1919, they had just under 10,000 members. Um, and that will be thinned out over the next couple of years uh, through people just walking away, uh, suicide, 16 people killed suicide, or, or killed themselves, I should say, excuse me, and 765 RIC officers were killed in, in, in action, in, in, in the call of duty. The impact of that obviously was huge. The Black and Tans were brought in as a supporting force to augment the RIC, and then by July 1920, the auxiliary force was introduced to Ireland really, I suppose, as a more targeted um, kind of police wing in terms of the IRA. So uh, ultimately, in the end of it all, nearly, I think, 10,000 black and tans would serve in Ireland, 2,214 auxiliaries. Uh, it was a huge force to bring into a country to police it, all done largely because uh, the British wouldn't take this on as a military war, if you like. But also, I suppose within that there was nuances within the War of Independence. For example, in Tipperary, it was a, it was a hot war, if you like. It was a lot of conflict, ambushes, atrocities, reprisals. If one side did one thing, the community expected the other side to hit back. It was very much a hot war, as I say. Whereas if you went to Dublin, there was a slightly different feel to it. Um, Dublin was was quieter, um, not as much action. Now, obviously, by 1920, you would have had the sacking of Balbriggan on the outskirts of the city in September. You would have had Sean Tracy killed on the street, uh, the Tipperary IRA man in October 1920. And, and of course, you had Kevin Barry as well in that ambush on Church Street and his hanging in the same month. But by and large, people in Dublin went about their daily business the same way as they always did. The War, the war of Independence in Dublin by November 1920 had become an intelligence war. Um, in the same way that the IRA were able to infiltrate all particles of, of British administration through civilians feeding back information to the IRA, which was then recycled, I suppose, and parlayed into, into targets for Michael Collins's infamous squad to go out and, and hit as, as, as desired by the IRA. 
the British authorities decided to enhance and intensify their intelligence efforts around that sort of springtime, summertime 1920. Um, under General Sir Armand Winter, they started uh, training potential agents and spies in Hounslow, just near Heathrow Airport, um, and they started sending them over during the summertime. And by the end of the summer, uh, between the auxiliaries and between this intelligence network that was beginning to seep into the IRA, the British were doing quite well, uh, to the point that a couple of Michael Collins's closest aides and allies had been taken in and arrested for questioning uh, in November 1920. By that stage, the IRA had already decided that they needed to do something, um, that this war, well, wasn't being fought on their terms anymore. They needed to strike back. I always, I suppose, compare it to a boxer on the ropes. They were, the British had them bouncing back against the ropes and they needed to come off and do something. Hence the operations on the morning of Bloody Sunday, which were beyond anything the IRA had ever planned previous to this. It was a citywide targeting of spies in boarding houses, hotels, lodgings, private houses, everywhere. Um, the numbers, we will never know the full list of people that were targeted, but we do know that 35 roughly were targeted uh, that morning. Uh, that morning, as I say, on Bloody Sunday, IRA squads just spread across the city, 35 targets. When they got to their, when they got to the houses, some people were at home, some people weren't. In the end of it all, there was 14 people killed. Um, and even within those attacks themselves lies so much of what the War of Independence was about. This was brutal killing. And again, I go back to this idea that we grew up with, I certainly I did, was that this was IRA hitmen going in, doing a job and running out again. This was not clean war. This was not clean kills. These were young men, teenagers, some of them, uh, being told to go into houses, up into bedrooms, get men out of their beds, in their pyjamas, and shoot them at point blank range. Some of the people who were killed were shot in front of children. They were shot in front of mistresses, wives, civilians who were in the house. Um, this was this was the most intense sort of killing. And again, I suppose we don't we wouldn't have thought about this all the years up. But anybody who was involved in the morning, they were all touched and, and scarred in some way. And a lot of them never quite fully recovered from what they were asked to do on Bloody Sunday morning. When we look at the the list of dead, as I say, uh, I think I might have said fourteen before. I meant to say fifteen. In the end, one of the one of, one of, one of the officers died later from his wounds. There is question marks over whether all of them were spies. Um, we can absolutely say for certain that six were, but there would be there would be scope for 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 debate around the rest. Um, again, it's symptomatic of the War of Independence as it was. Um, it seems trite almost to say that mistakes will be made. Uh, in a war like this, but they will be made. Um, you know, some of these some of these IRA men, there was one of them was going up the stairs in the Shelburne Hotel to a target. He saw his reflection in the mirror. He shot the mirror. This was this was the mindset of some of these guys. Uh, one of them recalls in, in, in a statement to the Bureau of Military History, um, he didn't sleep the night before. Another one drove around to the to the uh, the house they were going to the following morning just to have a look at the steps and visualize how it would be. But it was I don't think it was like what any of them imagined it would be like. Um, so the result of this is chaos in the city. Um, first thing that happens is the entire city is shut down. Checkpoints are erected, uh, trains are stopped, trams are stopped. And anyone with a connection to the British administration, they flock to Dublin Castle looking for safety, looking for, for refuge. And when it gets to the point that Dublin Castle is full, Anybody who's left outside is housed in hotels in the area around Dame Street and around Dublin Castle. And we're not just talking about employees, they brought their entire families with them. The fact that the IRA were able to strike in this way meant that everybody with a connection thought they might be a legitimate target next. So even though we could argue, excuse me, how many spies may have been killed in the morning, we cannot argue that the attack had exactly the desired effect that the IRA wanted. It created panic, it created chaos, it created the sense among the British authorities again that the IRA weren't finished. David Lloyd George had made a remark quite recently before Bloody Sunday that they felt that they had murder by the throat in Ireland. Well, the IRA that morning proved they did not have murder by the throat. In fact, the war was about to intensify to another level. In terms of Croke Park, 
and why they went to Croke Park. There was a consideration among the, among the British authorities in terms of, well, how did this happen? Who's behind this? Who's responsible? And their immediate reaction was that the Dublin Brigade of the IRA, it wasn't active enough and it wasn't vibrant enough and it wasn't big enough to carry out an, an operation like this. So in their heads that, yes, obviously the Dublin Brigade was involved and the, the IRA uh, hierarchy, if you like, in Dublin were certainly at the heart of it, but they felt that there must have been more help from somewhere else. So when they knew that there was a game between Tipperary and Dublin on in Crow Park, they wondered whether operatives had come up from the countryside, maybe disguised as supporters, and perhaps going to Croke Park, performing a search operation, might shake out a few leads. They might find things that might lead them to the perpetrators of the shooting in the morning. And that was essentially the reason, and that was essentially the plan. It was a search operation. Uh, a map of Croke Park was produced in Dublin Castle. They surveilled what exactly the, the layout of, of, of Croke Park was at the time. It pretty much, obviously the, the ground has changed a hell of a lot since then, but I mean, the basic geography was the same. You had the canal on the south end, you had the railway at the north end, you had Jones's Road on the, on the west side, and you had what's now the Cusack stand on the east side. It was a bank at that time. You had the Belvedere College sports grounds behind it. And this was this is what they were looking at. And the plan was to send a combined force of RIC auxiliaries and black and tans to Croke Park to perform a search operation. Uh, an officer would go onto the field with a megaphone, stop the game, inform everybody in the ground to stay where they were, that there was going to be a search operation carried out. Everybody would be searched and they'd see what they, they would find. A military force were at Croke Park, but they were there purely in a sort of a, a stewarding capacity, if you like. They were asked to form a cordon around Croke Park and make sure that there was an orderly exit as people left the ground. That was essentially the plan. And to some degree, in some small way, there was some logic to the British thinking. Um, for example, there were IRA people there. There were there were IRA squad members who were involved in the morning. Um, there were people, for example, I hope you're seeing the picture that I have up here. Uh, it's a picture of a, a team called Dunleary Commercials. Um, I'm just checking, I am sharing the screen, I am. <laughs> uh, it's a picture of Dunleary commercials. There was a game on before the Bloody Sunday game, before the Dublin Tipperary game, between Dunleary and Aaron's Hope. It was a replayed Dublin intermediate football final. It was Dunleary's first championship victory. They won the game. But if you look at the picture, there's a man second from the right in the back row wearing a, wearing a flat cap. That's Paddy Moran. And Paddy Moran was chairman of Dunleary GA Club, but he was also uh, the leader of a squad that went to the Gresham Hotel that morning and shot two men, uh, Wilde and McCormack. And after that attack took place, he eventually made his way to Crow Park to make sure he was there to see his team uh, win their first county title. Um, but beyond that, yes, you, as I say, yes, you had IRA squad members there as well from the morning. But beyond that, you also had a very broad church of people. Um, in the British mindsets, the GAA was connected to revolutionary politics and the men and women who were carrying out this, this war. In the GA minds, they were determined to stay apolitical. They were determined to stay games-based and they were determined to be seen in that way. Uh, Luke O'Toole was the general secretary at the time and he went to whatever lengths he could to try and maintain that public image. Even though in reality, the private views of the likes of Luke O'Toole and others at the top of the GA would very much have been in support of Sinn Féin, they would have known Michael Collins, O'Toole himself would have would have hosted Collins and the likes of Ono Duffy and Dan Breen and others in his house. But in public, they tried to maintain that gap between the GAA and the war that, that was that, that was being waged in the country. But in reality, I suppose by the, by November 1920, their own fortunes were very much tied to the fortunes of those who were who were fighting the war. Um, the games program for the GA, for example, was very much disrupted. Um, from the football side of things with Dublin and Tipperary playing in this challenge game, Dublin had already made an All-Ireland final. But even if you think about how they made it, the Leinster Championship was played off fine. But then they played an All-Ireland semi-final against Cavan at three days notice. The original game had been set for early September 1920, had to be called off. And then at very short notice, literally three days, they were told, both teams were told, get to Navin, we're going to play the game. Cavan were absolutely incensed because they had done a two week training camp to prepare for Dublin. And now they were kind of being, being parachuted back into the game out of nowhere. Dublin didn't mind. And it showed 
in the result. Dublin won very comfortably, but very significantly, there was a huge crowd at the game, an absolutely huge crowd at the match, which tells you the appetite there was there for games and to see matches at a time when there was very few. Tipperary, for their part, were stuck in the Munster Championship. Um, the hunger strike of Terence McSweeney and his subsequent death uh, resulted in the Cork County Board calling off all their games and the Munster Council itself then followed suit by calling off all their competitions and matches. So they were kind of stuck, which is why we had this game. And it comes it comes to fruition in the most fantastic way possible. Um, Tipperary have beaten Dublin in a couple of challenge games in the previous couple of years. But somehow, and these things just get legs no more than they do now, they got word that Dublin didn't really rate them and that they weren't overly impressed with Tipperary. So Tip took the opportunity to write a letter to the Freeman's Journal, and it also appeared in Sport magazine in early November, the 2nd of November. And it essentially read that they had heard Dublin's view of Tipperary, and they were quite disappointed, shall we say, and they were happy to go and play Dublin any place, any time, for any object. It was absolutely fantastic. It was like a heavyweight boxer calling out another, another heavyweight boxer and saying, I'll fight you anytime, any place, anywhere, and I'm going to take your belt off you. It was, it was just great. Now, the press at the time couldn't really understand what Tipperary were going on about. They weren't aware of a rivalry between these two. But it took, it gathered legs, and by the time they got to Crow Park on the 21st of November, 15,000 people turned up. And it was, you know, one of those, one of those fantastic occasions. This is the Dublin team uh, that would have, these are the Dublin players that would have played on Bloody Sunday. And again, <clears throat> it's interesting when we talk about the broad church the GA was at that time, it's it's very much evident in the two teams, in the Dublin team and the Tipperary team. If you can see the, the picture of Dublin I, I put up here in the back row, if you go six in from the left in the centre, you have Frank Burke, who would have fought in the Rising, would have been taught by Patrick Pierce, was given his first rifle by Patrick Pierce, went to Frangoch, came back, won an All-Ireland medal hurling with Dublin and was now one of the great Dublin footballers of the year and would end up winning five All-Ireland medals across hurling and football. He was the man that Michael Hogan was going to have to, was, was, was going to, have to mark. If you move along to the fort from the right, that's Johnny MacDonald, the Dublin goalkeeper. Johnny MacDonald, as well as playing in goal for Dublin that day, was also part of a squad that went to Upper Mount Street that morning to kill Lieutenants Ames and Bennett. Um, he went to that, partook in that in, in, in that raid, got back home, got his gear, sorted himself out and went straight to uh, went, went straight to Crow Park to hide in plain sight, really. Um, I'll move on. This is the Tipperary team. This picture was taken on Bloody Sunday itself. Apologies if the if the quality of the pictures isn't great. Hopefully you can you can make out these people. And I'm talking again about the the spread of people. You have Michael Hogan himself, if you're looking uh, from the far, from the from the back row, the man who's just about to sit, trying to sit down. If you count in from him, one, two, three, four, five, five in from the left, you'll see Michael Hogan poking his head in between two players. That's Michael Hogan himself. He was an IRA volunteer, 24 years of age from Grange Mawcler. He was a, in his second year with Tipperary at that stage, uh, playing cornerback. I'm very nervous about Mark and Frank Burke, uh, to the point that he actually approached Bill Ryan, who, if you walk along, from Michael Hogan, another one, two, three, four, five. His head is just poking in behind Tommy Ryan, the Tipperary midfielder. Uh, Bill Ryan, he was playing right half back and it's more experienced player than Michael Hogan. He asked him, would you swap? Bill Ryan said, oh, geez, I can't. His boots had been thrown out the window the following day on the train as they came up from, from Tipperary after a fight with some British soldiers. Um, so Hogan, to be fair to him, and, and you know, I think it's a measure of the man. The, the, the little that we know about him, I think this tells us a lot about him. He went back to his his kit bag, pulled out, uh, pulled out a lace and gave it to uh, Bill Ryan to tighten his boots with. And I, d I don't imagine that Bill Ryan ever thought he'd cherish that lace for the rest of his life, but he did. And just to, again, just to finish that point on that, this broad church, if, if you move back to the left from Bill Ryan, there's a, a kind of a blonde haired man, again, just behind the back row. Uh, that's Frank Scout Butler. He played in goal that day for Tipperary. Now, Frank Scout Butler, when all the firing had stopped, Frank was flat on his belly on the ground when the black and tans were going around, gathering up Tipperary players and bringing them up to the up, up to the railway wall where this picture was taken. And he kicked uh, one of them kicked Frank Scout Butler and said, "This is this is in revenge for what your Tipperary boys did this morning. Where's your gun?" And Frank Scout Butler looked up at him and he said, "I haven't fired a gun since the Somme," and pulled up his arm, pulled up his sleeve to reveal a regimental tattoo. 
Frank Scott Butler was a, an ex British Army serviceman who had, who, who had fought in World War One. So you had this mix of IRA men, former servicemen, um, labourers, farmers, shopkeepers, people who just wanted to play football for the sake of playing football. It wasn't a political statement. It wasn't any statement of them, of their Irishness or anything else. It was just purely for themselves. That was the, that was the mix of people that were in Crow Park. It's the mix of people who were who were who were who were playing the game. As I say, the game was delayed uh, for a half an hour because of the crowd, 15,000 people getting in. Um, and the warnings were there. The warnings were there in terms of stopping the game. Michael, Holt, or Michael Collins himself had gone, had called into a bar uh, the night before, Shanahan's Bar in the Monto, which was a temporary pub, but also would have had IRA connections through Phil Shanahan as the owner, called in very, very late and told anyone who was listening not to go to Croke Park the following day that, that it probably wouldn't be a safe place to be. Um, that afternoon, three IRA men came to Croke Park looking for Luke O'Toole, the general secretary, to tell him that they had gotten information through the Dublin Metropolitan Police that there was some kind of a force coming to Crow Park. They didn't know what they were coming for. They didn't know what the outcome might be. But their advice to the GAA was call this game off. We, we just don't know what they're going to do. And Luke O'Toole was caught again in the horns of that dilemma around, well, do I want the GAA to be seen to be reacting to an act of political violence this morning? Do I, do I want the GAA linked to this in any way? Also, he had the more practical issue of getting the crowd out safely. Would evacuating the ground actually cause more panic than anything that, uh, excuse me, anything that uh, the auxiliaries and black and tans might visit upon the ground themselves? People were used to trucks, police trucks flying around and intimidating people and so on and so forth. No one for a second imagined that shooting would break out, that a massacre would occur, that Crow Park would be turned from a from a place of complete and utter happiness into this this theatre of horror in the space of 90 seconds. So the game went ahead. Uh, by 3.25, the game was on 10 minutes. Michael Hogan, who, as I said earlier, was nervous about marking Frank Burke, was now running for a ball with Frank Burke. And at the same time, uh, the police trucks outside bringing around 100 auxiliaries, black and tans, had just arrived on the canal bridge on Jones's Road. And the truck snaked all the way back down Russell Street, back up towards Mountjoy Square. The military were in place in their car and everything was ready to go. Uh, a Major Dudley, who was in charge of the black and tans, jumped out of the second truck and ordered more trucks up Jones's Road to another entrance, <clears throat> excuse me, which would have been roughly positioned, give or take, in around just opposite the Crow Park Hotel. Uh, he got out. But as he got out and he was directing traffic, essentially, police started jumping out of uh, the trucks and instead of forming lines and getting organised to perform a search, some of them headed straight down towards the turnstiles. Some of them took positions on the canal bridge and they started firing. The first shot, we reckon, hit 11 year old William Robinson, who was sitting in a tree which would have been at roughly at the corner of what's now the Davin end, the canal end and the Hogan stand. He was sitting in the tree and when he heard the noise behind him, he turned around and the shot, the first shot, first bullet went through his chest and out his shoulder, knocking him from the tree. The second shot hit Jerome O'Leary. He was a 10 year old boy sitting on a wall just further down from William Robinson. He shot him in the head, knocked him from the wall. These are the two guys. There's William on the left hand side, <clears throat> excuse me, 11 years of age. Again, apologies for the quality of the picture, but I think to have any kind of image of these kids now is absolutely, it's, it's just so precious. That's William, Jerome is on the right hand side. It's a younger picture of Jerome. <clears throat> he was 10 years of age and he was killed. He was probably a bit younger then um, when that picture was, when that particular picture was taken. But those are the two, Th those, those are the two. Just to go through maybe some of the other people who were killed. The boy in the middle is 14 year old John William Scott. He grew up on Fitzroy Avenue, which is right across the road from Crow Park. He would have come across the road, gone into Crow Park. And when the firing started, he was hit by a ricocheted bullet, which hit him in the chest. He was carried out to a house up on Clonliffe Road uh, and laying on a table where they said prayers. And he lasted for 45 minutes before he died. His body was put out on the street outside 
uh, to be collected by an ambulance. Um, when the shooting had stopped, his father, John Scott, uh, came out of his home on Fitzroy Avenue, went up the road asking around, looking to see had anyone seen his boy. And he was directed to that house on Clanliff Road. When he got to the house, the lady of the house, Mrs. Coleman, uh, came out to the door and she said, yes, John had been there and he had he had died. Um, but obviously, of course, as any father would, he he resisted the idea. He said, how do you know? How do you know that was my son? And it wasn't until the lady pressed John Williams glasses and his tie pin into his father's hand that his father accepted that, yes, it's, this is this is my son and this is this is um, this was his grief to bear. Tom Ryan is on the left hand side. Tom Ryan is 27 years of age from Wexford originally lived on Viking Road in Stony Batter. Uh, he was a he was an IRA man He worked for the gas company. He was actually on a job on Sunday morning. They called to a house on Marlborough Road, which had been quite close to where he lived, but there was no one at home. After that, he went home and he considered not going to the game, but his family was up from Wexford to go to the match. Uh, so, so they went to the game and when the firing was at its height and Michael Hogan had been hit and lying on the ground bleeding out, Tom Ryan instinctively just ran to him, whispered an act of contrition in his ear and in that action he was shot uh, through the back and he crawled out of Croke Park. He was collected by an ambulance and taken to hospital where he died that night. On the right hand side of the picture, or sorry, excuse me, on the right hand side of the screen, uh, you have Daniel Carroll. He was 31 years of age. He was from Temple Derry in County Tipperary. That's a picture of him with his sister May. Um, she also lived in Dublin. And Daniel's, I suppose, twin interest in life was looking after his sister and going to the matches. Uh, he was a great man to go to games. He worked in a pub in Drumcondra. And he was actually leaving the ground. He was out of the ground and walking down Russell Street when a stray shot came out of a, a police lorry and hit him in the leg. And he was taken to hospital. And he, he lived he lived on through Monday, he's, his employer, Martin Kennedy, recalled afterwards going to meet him, or going to visit him, I should say. And Daniel had actually turned up to work that morning and uh, had said, you know, I don't know, will I go to the match or not? And he decided in the end to go to the game. And Martin Kennedy recalled the following day in hospital, Daniel just looking at him and saying, wasn't it just misfortunate that I went? And Daniel lasted on through Monday into Tuesday and he, he died on Tuesday. These two men, Joseph Trainer on the left hand side, he was 20 years of age from Ballymount, uh, just kind of outside. He would have lived roughly around where the where the Red Cow is now, uh, the Red Cow Hotel and that. Uh, as you can see, he played football for a team called Young Emmets. He was also an IRA volunteer. He went to the game with his friend PJ Ryan. They cycled in and he was climbing out over the canal wall at the back of the goal when the shooting, when, when he was shot twice in the back and he fell out over the canal wall. Um, when the, again, when the firing stopped, people from the area sort of crept up the canal looking to see could they help the wounded and members of the Ring family carried Joseph Trainer back to their house on Sackville Gardens which is just behind Crow Park and they kept him there until an ambulance came and they carried him out uh, in, down a back lane and put him in an ambulance and he, he died just as he arrived in hospital. He was, as I say, he was 20 years of age. James Matthews on the right hand side lived on North Cumberland Street. He was a labourer. Uh, he was trying to climb a wall. He, again, he went with a friend. They were both trying to climb a wall, which would have been up near the junction of what's now Hill 16 and the Cusack stand. And as he was climbing the wall, his friend got over, but he's uh, but he got shot in the leg. He slid back down the wall and he bled out in Croke Park. Um, he left behind a wife, Kate, and two daughters. And Kate was also pregnant with their third daughter, six months pregnant at that stage. Um, and he was buried in Glasnevin the following week. Jane Boyle is on the left hand side here. Jane Boyle was 29 years of age. She lived on Lennox Street in Portobello, which for anybody with knowledge of the geography of that particular area, if you know the Bretzel Bakery, uh, which is on the corner just before Portobello Bridge, Jane Boyle lived on that street. Um, she went to the game with her fiance, Daniel Byron. They were, she was, they were due to be married the following week. And when the firing started, they started running up towards that exit I mentioned on uh, just at Hill 16 in the Cusack stand. But as the firing went on, uh, Jane was hit in the back and she was she was holding on to Daniel's arm and Daniel recalled afterwards feeling her hand sag on his arm and he was just swept away with the crowd and she was lost underneath the crowd. He tried to get back in again after he got outside, but they wouldn't let him back in. Um, she was 29 years of age um, and she was actually she was buried in her wedding dress the following week. The man on the right is Tom Hogan. He was 19 years of age from Tankardstown in County Limerick, just outside Kilmallock. And Tom was shot in the shoulder. Uh, 
taken to hospital and he was actually the last Bloody Sunday victim to die the following Friday. Um, from a very strong IRA family, he was taken back to Drummond Cemetery in Limerick where he was buried. And although the families were told no shows of strength or anything like that, if they had IRA connections, there was a volley of shots fired over Tom Hogan's grave, same as there were for Joseph Trainer as well. And some other, a couple of other people who would have been IRA volunteers among the dead, Tom Ryan as well. Um, but the interesting thing that always, I suppose, a very poignant thing, Tom was wearing a coat that day and when, when the family got his body back, they, they took the coat and they cleaned it and they sewed up the hole and they kept the coat for a hundred years. It's, we talk about these people being forgotten, but the families, their families never forgot them. They knew to cherish and to curate their memories. And a lot of the families had little things like that pocket Bible from Tom, that, that, that Tom Ryan had in his pocket and something like Tom Hogan's coat. Um, it was priceless to the family and I, I think it should be priceless to all of us. Um, I'll come to this photograph in a little while, but just to go through some of the other victims we spoke about, Michael Hogan, James Burke and James Tehan were both crushed at that corner uh, between between Hill 16 and the Cusack stand. An armoured car came down St. James's Avenue as everybody was surging out that exit, fired into the air, pushing the crowd back in, causing the crush, the fatal crush that, that claimed James Burke and James Tehan. Patrick O'Dowd was a 57-year-old labourer. Uh, he was climbing a seven foot high wall that ran, al ran along the bank where the Cusack stand is now. There was a 20 foot drop down the other side. Um, but instead of jumping, he got up to the top of the wall and started pulling people over to safety. Um, it was an extraordinary thing he did. And he landed when he was shot and killed, he landed on the last man he saved. Uh, the last person I want to mention is Michael Feary. Um, he was wounded in the thigh and he bled out on the canal bridge, but he died wearing his British Army fatigues. He had served during World War One, which again just tells us that the broad church, again, I use that expression of people that would have gone to games that time uh, and the broad the, the broad group of people that were interested in GA and that were that were part of Bloody Sunday. The impact obviously is, is catastrophic in terms of the families themselves, the people they've lost, but also in terms of if we take it, if we take the emotion out of the, the political impact, the clamour to control the story begins straight away. Um, Dublin Castle itself, there are three statements released that night. All of them say that the first firing came from inside the ground, that police were retaliating. They'd say that there was 30 revolvers found inside in the ground and a number of different documents and things like that. Um, the whole idea from the beginning is to push the blame onto the IRA or unknown gunmen who provoked this massacre. Um, that continues on through the week, but as the newspaper reports come out during the week, it's very, very difficult to maintain this story. Eyewitness accounts are talking about the first shots coming from the bridge outside the canal bridge. Um, they're describing a scene where there are no shots from inside, that this entire disaster is created and, and instigated by the police, the rash actions of the police who have come to perform a search operation, but actually turn it into a reprisal. There are questions in the House of Commons. Uh, there are fistfights in the House of Commons. Joe Devlin, an Irish Party MP from West Belfast, tries to ask questions about the Bloody Sunday Dead, and he's actually pulled down into the row in front of him where he's standing by a, by a Major John Molson, who was a Conservative Party MP at the time. Um, while the British government, understandably, I suppose, wanted to concentrate on the dead of the morning, they really didn't give a lot of time to the circumstances of the killing of their own citizens at that time in Croke Park that afternoon. Um, in Britain, the reaction is that the IRA are, are going to bring the war to Britain now. Uh, the House of Parliament are closed as a security measure. Uh, the gates at the top of Downing Street are closed because a rumour begins that the IRA are going to perform some kind of a, an attack involving cars hurtling down Downing Street. Um, there's rumours everywhere that the IRA are going to poison the water with typhoid. Um, it's this kind of creating of, of terror. Arthur Griffith and other Sinn Féin leaders try to talk it back, try to say this is, this is not the case, but it's very, very hard to get that message across. In the time after Bloody Sunday, into the time after the 21st of November, again, part of trying to control this story, two courts of military inquiry are installed in Jervis Street Hospital and the Matter Hospital, the two hospitals where most of the, the, the dead and wounded were taken. Uh, it, they last for 18 days. They start very soon after Bloody Sunday itself. 35 witnesses are called and we're talking about police. We're talking about eyewitnesses. 
Luke O'Toole uh, from the GA is the only GA person who testifies. Um, they're held in camera, so no public are in, allowed in, no press, which causes its own level of controversy at the time. And again, the nature of the evidence, it varies. Um, you have, for example, Major E.L. Mills, the head of the auxiliary force there, who effectively saved the Tipperary team from being killed that evening when he stood in between a force of black and tans who had the Tipperary team up against a wall and were ready to kill them. He escorted the team away to safety. Mills went back to Beggar's Bush Barracks that night and wrote a, wrote a memo essentially saying that the firing was instigated by the police and it was just an absolute catastrophe. But we never see that memo again. But he gives evidence roughly similar to that. But in parallel to that, you have auxiliaries and black and tans testifying that firing came from inside the ground. You even had one eyewitness spectator who says that three men stood out from the grandstand and fired in the air. And really that, that evidence is sufficient for the course of military inquiry to come to the conclusion that yes, the first firing came from inside the ground. They do say that the, the, re the retaliation from the police was in excess of what was required, but they remain steadfast that the first firing came from inside the ground. And at first glance at the evidence, there is there is evidence, sworn evidence to say that this happened. But when you start to delve into the nature of the evidence and the, the conflicts therein, very quickly it falls apart. David Leeson, a uh, Canadian professor, was one of the first people to see these reports. The reports were sealed after they were written until 1999. But Leeson wrote a fantastic paper in 2003, essentially deconstructing what happened in Crow Park in, a, in the most forensic way ever. Um, to try and get to the heart of what exactly happened. And in his findings, it's very, very clear that there are conflicting evidence. So, for example, uh, there's one RIC constable said that they went in one particular uh, gate and firing came back at them. But you have conflicting evidence from two Dublin Metropolitan Police officers that that very same constable took his men in a completely different gate. So you have you have small things like that. The autopsy reports very much come into play. I mentioned William Robinson and Jerome O'Leary, two very important figures in this. William Robinson turns from his perch in the tree to the left as though he's looking at noise behind him and a bullet goes through his chest and out his right shoulder, indicating that he's turning. It's the same with Jerome O'Leary. He's shot in the face. He is facing from, from whence the firing is coming. If the firing had started inside the ground, it is almost certain that those children would either have been shinning down a tree, dropping off a wall, they would certainly have been looking in a different direction. And it's the same with the nature of where the people ran. If firing began inside the ground at a different location from where the police were, they would have run in a totally different direction. It would have been a complete chaos of running. It would have been totally, it would have been a totally different scenario than a very much a uniform run from the southwest corner where the firing was coming from to the northeast corner and the north end where people trampled through what was Hill 60 and out onto the trams to escape outside. When you put all these things together with the newspaper reports, it becomes very clear very, very quickly that the firing came from outside the ground, that this was a search operation that went wrong. It may well have been a very, very small group of police that started the firing, but it lasted for 90 seconds. It killed 14 people and the responsibility for that very much lay with the British authorities and the police that were there in Crow Park that day. There was no subsequent action. There was there was no inquiries from the police side of things. Essentially, it was just left be. And it was very much the case for the Bloody Sunday Dead as well. It mirrored, one mirrored the other. While the victims in the morning received state funerals, some of them were buried, were, their, excuse me, their funeral services were held in Westminster Abbey, Westminster Cathedral. The Bloody Sunday victims in the afternoon they were given very strict instructions, as I mentioned before, no shows of strength, no flags, no speeches, and very, very much, I suppose, very much as, as it is now when you go to a funeral, when we're in lockdown, keep it to close family and friends, no more and no less. And they were buried and their stories were essentially buried with them. Um, in terms of commemoration, we're looking here at a picture of the Tipperary team in 1921. For every year up until the mid 70s, Tip and Dublin played a game this is the 19. This is a picture from the 1921 game. They're standing at the spot where Michael Hogan was killed. Um, this was the nature of commemoration. The people were forgotten. Michael Hogan and the and the, the killing on Bloody Sunday of Michael Hogan very much became the central idea of this. 
Bloody Sunday became a political idea, if you like, rather than a human tragedy. Uh, the impact on the families of that was immense. They would occasionally come to the, come to the GA, for example, trying to share their stories, wouldn't get the chance. Um, alienated, frustrated, angry over, over many, many years. I think the impact on the GA itself, in modern terms, it's almost like post-traumatic stress. They didn't really know how to deal with it. Um, and it wasn't until the last couple of years uh, with the, I suppose, with the finding out of more about these people and particularly the beginning of the Bloody Sunday Graves project, where eight of the victims who had been left in unmarked graves for, for 95 years, the GA in conjunction with the families got together to erect headstones to remember them. And in this way, the GA found a different way into the story. They reconnected with the families that maybe they didn't connect with, look after, maybe you could say. Certainly when you when you hear GA President John Horn and other people talking about it, they talk now about 14 people who went to a game and never came home. They talk about a duty of care to the Bloody Sunday families and the Bloody Sunday dead. And I think in a year of commemoration like this, it's all about that. That's that's where it is. It's about the people. It's about remembering the forgotten. This is just an example of, of one of the headstones. This is Daniel Carroll's headstone. Um, and I think that's brought, knowing their stories, it's brought a space for healing. It's brought a space for healing from the GA point of view that they can engage with this story in a different way. It's brought healing for the families in the sense that their people are being remembered again. And it's brought a kind of a, a, a different perspective for us that we can set aside maybe the, the idea of Bloody Sunday that we were told, that through no fault of anybody's, this was just the idea, this was the story we were told. We now have so much more information about it, we can approach it in such a different way. We can see that, you know, the crowd that went to a match in Croke Park, this variety of different people, men, women, children, people who saw the GA as an expression of their identity, people who just saw it as a, a match to go to, people who went, as I say, as that expression of, of who they were, people who just went because they wanted something to have the crack about the following week. That's always, that's still the case now. The people who died on Bloody Sunday are our people. We are them. They are us. Um, and I'll just leave you with one last story. Um, James Matches, as, as I mentioned before, uh, he was also buried in an unmarked grave. And I mentioned that his wife was pregnant uh, when he died. Well, this is his daughter, Nancy Dillon. And in 2016, August 2016, um, we were blessed that Nancy was there the day that uh, we, were, we, we erected um, James Matches' gravestone. The legacy of these people to us, their gift to us in this year of centenary is their stories and the understanding that we get from their stories and the different perspective that we get from their stories about Bloody Sunday, about what it means to us now, about what it means to the GA, about why it's important. And I think, again, in, in this year of, 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 of centenary, I suppose our gift to them, the one thing we can give to them is not to forget them this year or any other year into the future. So just like I said, thanks very much for listening. I hope I didn't go on too long. I hope most of you stayed the course. Um, and if you've got any questions or whatever, I guess I'll hand back to you, Gary. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody wants to get into get, get into the nitty gritty. Thanks very much, Michael. Thank you Thanks so much. Uh, th th you've mentioned there very at the end how much it means to us and how central and important this is to us and that is so so true and you have really brought out to us this evening in your in your lecture you talk about so much more information being available but i think you have shown both through your research to your writing through your ongoing work in terms of other documentaries which we look forward to seeing but especially this evening in here and now you've brought together very much the human aspect of, of all of this the you know the the, the power that the, the behind bloody sunday it being the people themselves the the events the chaos in the city even the the gaa activities like how for example how the match it, itself came happened to come about and what in turn that led to and how that had interacted uh, you brought in a very poignant way to uh, the people their lives the mix uh, that broader, that broader, that broader grasp, and I think most poignantly, uh, the victims themselves, uh, the human perspective, 
uh, you know, the, the instinctive nature of it as well. You, for example, John William Scott's father, uh, you, you mentioned how, how some of the victims were actually died, helping to save others and so on. Uh, the children in, in particular, there's so much there and that is at the heart of what we are remembering uh, in Common in, in Lucas Scale in the GA, in Croke Park and in, in Ireland and further afield uh, this, this November and this year. So thanks, uh, Michael, for bringing that, uh, bringing that to us. Um, there's one question I see here on the Q&A. Uh, I'll just bring it to you. It's from Pat Daly. Uh, do you have any information on the Aaron's Hope team that played on Bloody Sunday? Very little, um, really very little. It was, the, you know, no more than now. It, it was the teacher training college um, team. When you go in and look for match reports from the time, they don't uh, necessarily carry the, the, the names or anything like that. So it's it's uh, it's a bit vague in terms of who might have been involved at that time. But I think it would be safe to say, and this kind of speaks a little bit to the to the universality, if they like, a Bloody Sunday. I mean, I think sometimes, you know, when we talk about it, it gets it gets squeezed down to Dublin and actually even more so down to Tipperary. But, you know, when you look at the, the victims, the spread, and also then if you think about Aaron's Hope, I mean, it's more than likely, it's almost certain that that team would have been populated by people from outside of Dublin, um, which again gives you a sense of the scope of the people who would have been there that particular day. But in terms of specifics, I've actually, I looked into it again there recently for somebody and really there's not an awful lot of detail in terms of it. all we know is that they lost. Yeah. OK, fine. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure again, maybe over time, that's something else that uh, more material will become will become available. And, and again, uh, again, it's useful to say as well where there is material becoming available, where there are other artefacts to let us know at the at the GA Museum in Crow Park. You know, we have the uh, Bloody Sunday exhibition as part of the uh, the Bloody the Bloody Sunday Remembrance uh, events and, and experience and of course obviously we're somewhat limited at the moment due to the due to the lockdown and so on there but after that that with that you you will have an opportunity to come in and see that and there are a number of artifacts there that have uh, some of them only recently uh, donated to us that that are that are are available so just at this point just to wrap up just to say uh, thanks uh, very much to you again, Michael, for your uh, for bringing, as I said, your your expertise, your research, bringing it to us in in such a vivid way and uh, bring bringing it to life, and especially in such a poignant way, uh, reflecting on the information that and the evidence that's been there, but but adding to it in in, in a way that brings that brings the story. Of, of Bloody Sunday to us that we're, that we're commemorating. Uh, and uh, just to say, to say thanks to you, I know you're a very happy cork man today uh, 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 <laughs> uh, uh, after yesterday and uh, nothing wrong with that. And nope. uh, so also to say thanks to uh, Julianne McKeague, our uh, marketing uh, manager at, at Croke Park, uh, the Museum of Croke Park for organising uh, the, these events and setting, setting us up and keeping me on the, on the straight and narrow up here sitting in Castle Blaney in County Monaghan at the moment and we're, 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 we're all connected. And just to say that we're looking forward to our next um, our next lecture this night week, the 16th, when Dr Siobhan Doyle of the Technical University in Dublin will talk to us about commemorating conflict, remembering Bloody Sunday and difficult history. So we look forward to that as, as the next in our series next Monday night. You can get tickets via the, uh, the, via the GA website, via the museum website, and uh, feel free to spread the word about it. But thank you most especially to all of you who have joined us here this evening, because without you, this event couldn't happen. Uh, your participation and your interest in it uh, is, 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 what, is what makes it all worthwhile. And the, the lecture will, will be available online uh, in, in, the day, in the days ahead. So thanks again to you, Mike. Thanks to Julianne and especially to all of you who have joined us here this evening. Slán a wáile, slán gafól. Gór míle maha